Back in the day, if you were shopping for audio equipment, you typically find yourself at a Circuit City or a Sears, where they'd have shelves sorted by brand and price, typically arranged with like the best stuff on top and working its way down to the bottom shelf where the lower quality stuff was. And that's why I always thought that whatever was on display was all there was. Like the best stuff is at the top, the low stuff's at the bottom, and there's no secret room somewhere. I'm hesitant to admit this, but I didn't even know there was a whole separate set of Sony Hi-Fi audio products until a few months ago when I was shopping for this graphic equalizer. I'll explain a little bit more about how I came to that realization, but that's what this video is all about. Sony's separate and not available at Sears or Circuit City Hi-Fi family known as Sony ES Elevated Standard. So this whole thing started when I set out to search for a graphic equalizer a few months ago. A simple eBay search yielded the results that you typically expect to find for a vintage equalizer, ranging from $50 for items that didn't work to a few hundred dollars for well-maintained working units. But within that search, this showed up. Now, I'm well aware that there are plenty of top-of-the-line audio products out there, but with a buy-it-now price of $1,500, my curiosity was definitely piqued. Sure, there are some eBay sellers out there that shoot for the stars when pricing an item, but something about this seemed legitimate, considering this wasn't even in the same price universe compared to the other search results. This equalizer is the Sony SEQ333ES, but the ES in the part number wasn't immediately obvious to me. Only after searching for this equalizer on YouTube did I finally realize there were other ES components, particularly with the cherry wood side panels. After I saw this, my investigation began. Now, I admit I'm starting somewhat in the middle here with this 1984 ES catalog because it's the earliest components catalog I could find, plus it's this early 80s era that really launched the ES into what it is today. But I can still say a few things about what I found about its origins while I flip through some catalogs. A full history of its early origins is hard to come by, but from what I could find, the earliest ES components seemed to date back to 1954, with some of their first broadcast quality open reel-to-reel -reel recorders garnering the part numbers ES1 and ES2. While it is uncertain if this was intentionally meant to be the start of a hi-fi family, the first true ES series launched in 1965, with the TA-1120, and by 1969, Sony added additional components to round out the ES offering, including power amps, preamps, turntables, tone arm speakers, tuners, a cartridge, and another open reel-to-reel -reel recorder. At the time, use of the ES moniker was not part of the part numbering system, and the abbreviation ES was not officially declared, and even Sony executives didn't precisely define exactly what ES meant. Some Japanese publications alternated between Extremely High Standard and Extreme Standard series, while some U.S. publications called it Excellent Series and even Extremely Standard, which doesn't make any sense because there was nothing standard about these high-end products. Throughout its decades-long existence, ES went through different iterations, with the 1982 through 1985 era being the first real foray into the U.S. market with a dedicated lineup, standalone catalogs, and a clearly defined branding push with the ES name being prominently marketed and integrated into the part numbers. This fourth generation ES series sold quite well and was given a sales boom with the new at the time introduction of CD players. But it's the late 80s and early 90s generation of ES components that appear to be the most coveted in their history, and that's what I'm going to focus on. So, officially, ES stands for Elevated Standard. And this is Sony's top of the line audio products that, according to them, emphasize the highest build quality and refinements to deliver an unmatched audio and video experience. You'll remember that I mentioned my embarrassment that I didn't even know ES existed until recently. But I feel somewhat vindicated because, like I mentioned, these were not sold in your standard electronics stores. ES products were only sold through Sony qualified AV specialty retailers and custom installers, which meant you wouldn't be able to find Sony ES products in your typical big box store. So at least I don't feel so bad about not knowing these existed until now. But now I do know these exist, and I have a tech channel on YouTube, so you know what that means. eBay time. But first, I needed to decide on what I would buy. I realized that anything I purchase would be replacing something I already have. So after much deliberation, I decided a cassette deck would be my focus. Now, I recently posted a video of me replacing the belts on my original Sony cassette deck that I got back in high school, and I made this prophetic claim. And I don't listen to tapes but I'm still gonna fix it. Well, apparently I do listen to tapes now, so here it is. 
may I introduce to you the newest member of my hi-fi family, the Sony TC-K770ES. So let me talk through and demo some of the features of this unit. Not surprisingly, I found this one on eBay, and the majority of ES owners know exactly what they have, so these units are typically in excellent condition and priced to reflect that. This eBay seller was no exception, and I appreciated the care in how well this was double boxed when it arrived to me. As a funny side note, you may remember at the beginning of this video that I mentioned that ES components were not sold in Sears or Circuit City, but I had to chuckle when the unit arrived because I noticed the eBay seller's last name was actually Sears, so I guess you could say I ended up buying this from Sears anyway. So, like I mentioned, this is the Sony TC-K770ES. It is a single unit tape deck from 1991, and I can tell you it is definitely not like your standard tape deck. The first thing I noticed right away was the size and weight of this thing. Just by looking at it next to standard components, you can immediately notice the build quality is next level. Now, I don't want to unfairly compare this to a standard tape deck because it wouldn't be a fair fight, but I think it will provide some helpful insight because of most people's familiarity with a standard unit like my Sony TC-WR690. So let me start by showing you some of the things that make this unique or different than your standard tape deck. First, when you press the power button, a backlight comes on behind the cassette, which is a nice feature so you can easily see how much tape you have left when the cassette is inserted, plus you can see the tape in motion better too. Next, and perhaps my favorite feature, is the motorized door. I'm not even sure why this impresses me so much, but it's extra details like this that make these special. Now, compare that to your typical spring-loaded door, and you can see why little appointments like this set it apart from your typical tape deck. Next up is the vacuum fluorescent display, which is bright, responsive, and large. Again, this is an unfair comparison, but for the sake of showing what I mean, the top pick here is my WR690, and the bottom is the K770ES. The ES is just bigger and brighter, and I would expect that on a unit costing three times as much. So let's talk about recording. These ES models are superior at recording and it even has a calibration mode that allows you to maximize the recording quality to its full potential. To activate this feature, you'll first need to choose a tape style. Lots of tape decks from this era, including my WR690, can auto-detect the insertion of a Type 1 chromium dioxide or metal tape. Not surprisingly, this ES model can do the same, but it will uniquely show you which type you've inserted on the display. Once you've inserted a tape, you will have the option to set your recording levels using the large recording level dial, which, by the way, is made of metal. Again, it's a minor detail, but each unique feature like this just adds to its quality. In this case, I've inserted a Type 4 metal tape, and since you can record higher on a metal tape, the meter moves so you can adjust the volume accordingly. By pressing the calibration button, I am now in calibration mode. This mode changes the screen and will allow me to adjust the recording bias and fine tune the recording level within plus or minus three decibels. When I press record, it starts recording and generates two test tones, an 8 kHz tone on the high meter and a 400 Hz tone on the low level. I can then adjust the bias and record level knobs until they meet the arrows. Note that the tones are not audible during the calibration cycle, but I can rewind it and play it back to reveal the tones. I'll play this back through the spectrum analyzer and you'll be able to see the 400 Hz bar clearly and you can see a little bit of the 8 kHz tone coming through on the 6.3 kHz bar. I also recorded a sine wave sweep to see the responsiveness of the tape itself, and as you'll see here, it impressively held the tones throughout the entire range. I pulled a song from the YouTube audio library and recorded it onto a metal tape so you can see and hear what I mean about the responsiveness of the meters jumping in unison with the equalizer. I admit I'm skipping over some functions like the Dolby B and C noise reduction and HX Pro features, 
but these were standard on most tape decks at the time, and I'm really just trying to point out some of the more unique features of the ES. Now, if you've watched any other videos on my channel, you'll know that I like to crack these open to take a look inside, so let's do that. And in typical Sony fashion, there are four screws holding down the lid, so remove those and lift off the top to expose the inside. Now that it's open, I'm really only looking for leaking or bulging caps or anything else that might stand out as a potential problem. I'm also noticing there are a lot of pots to make precision adjustment to things like recording levels, tape bias level, and almost anything that has a level, so this is yet another thing that sets apart the ES from a typical deck. Other than maybe the belts, which were already replaced by the previous owner, I'd say that most repairs inside here would likely be beyond my repair capability. But I still like to take a peek under the hood in case a problem does arise, then I have a baseline recording of it to see if it's something I can repair on my own, or if I have to take it to a pro. Taking a look at the tape mechanism itself reveals a very clean and well-made unit which touts a three-head closed loop dual capstan quartz lock direct drive for precision recording and playback. I see some belts and a few motors in there, so I assume one drives the deck and the other opens and closes the tape door. Oh, and one more thing while I have this out. As you can see here, it features gold-plated inputs and outputs on the back, and a gold-plated headphone jack on the front. Honestly, I don't know how much this makes a difference in sound, but I'm not complaining. So, what do I think about Sony ES, not only in terms of this tape deck, but in general? Well, I'm definitely convinced that ES components are undoubtedly a worthy player in the hi-fi world. It's also nice to see that this ahead-of-its-time equipment was built to last, and I'm super pleased with this purchase. Plus, with cassette tapes kind of making a comeback, I'm glad I decided on a tape deck as my first ES unit. So where does this leave me with my old high school tape deck? Sorry, for now it's back into storage for you. Farewell WR690, we hardly knew ye. But seriously, if you wanted to know more about the Sony ES family, or about this particular tape deck, I do hope you enjoyed this journey as much as I did. And while I didn't know that ES was a thing until recently, I certainly enjoyed going on an eBay treasure hunt and reviewing all the features on this new-to-me hi-fi equipment. I don't want to make any promises, but I can easily see myself putting together a system made entirely of ES components. I'll start saving now. If you like what you just watched, please consider liking and subscribing. Thanks for watching!